What's going on guys? My name is Tommy. Welcome back to the channel. I I want to say welcome to a Tommy Uncut, but that's that's not as accurate as it could be. Rather, welcome to our next video. We uh we've had some times in Carrying Ground. Achilles is wanting to nom on my hands right now. Oh, now he does boops. Will you please just once do a boop on camera? Please. This is my struggle. But Carrying Crown's been really rough lately. If you've been watching our live plays, I know not a lot of people do. This channel's a lot of things. Critical Role ain't one of them. But I've learned some pretty valuable TTRPG lessons from Carrying Crown uh, because half the party died in two sessions. And not only am I here today to talk about what is a really terrifying dungeon and a really, really spooky trap that players won't see until they've stepped in it, but also it got me to thinking, you know, is death really the end in TTRPGs? I'm here to say no. If you like and what you're seeing, like, subscribe, get a boop from a cat. He just stares at me. I, I should have been a dog person. Stay caught up on all your Pathfinder this and this many edition coverage today. Today, your content was brought to you in part by 360 Mac Gamer. Oh, hey, on that note, I haven't got around to putting it together yet, but we're gonna bring back the big long outro think I'm gonna put all my patrons in a special thank you in that in a little animated thing because I know there's some of you that I don't shout out as much as I could and hey why not learn how to use my editing software right it's a win-win but Ross thank you for your support this video is kind of about you so that's fun anyway Schloss Karamark oh by the way if you hadn't figured it out I am about to spoil the ever-living crap at a book two of Carrying Crown you have been warned to be honest, I'm probably going to spoil some other stuff in pop culture too, but dungeon time. The last part of book two, Rescue at Schloss Karamark, takes place at a castle, in fact named Schloss Karamark. You're sent there because somebody that you helped recently, I'm trying to spoil as little as possible here, wanted you to meet them there. You eventually realize the Whispering Way has come here before you, there's been a lot of shenanigans go down and you kind of just have to run through a horrendous, horrendous amount of traps. What starts as, ah, eh, here's some trolls, whatever, that's fine, turns rapidly into much more terrifying things. The door at G2 has a summon monster trap. It summons an air elemental that really wants to bull rush you off that bridge. I'm not even really sure off the top of my head what's in G3 through G10 because my party used a rope of climbing to go over that building and come out the other side. H2 has, oh, you know, rust monsters in it, need I say more. But the scarier bit comes once you start on that bridge at what I guess is I and then into the J's. Not only is a swaying rope bridge with a 150 foot drop scary in and of itself, there's a trap on the middle of that bridge that summons an Aranese, summons a creature that shoots flaming arrows at people. Oh, and if you can cast fly on yourself, the Aranese can just entangle you with its rope, outfly you, shoot you down, and you fall. The party did their best to fight it off, the party did their best to hide from it, and I'll always be a big fan of hero points in Pathfinder games because in any game that supports a system like that, because sometimes the RNG just is really mean to you and having an ability to hedge your bets once a session seems quite reasonable. And Aranes, of course, is a creature who likes to draw out the suffering of their opponents, of their foes. Now, I'm not exactly gonna start torturing my players any more than this dungeon already had, but by that logic, I did feel it was more than reasonable for the Aranes with them flaming arrows to set the bridge on fire, cutting off their escape as they're trying to get through a door that I set up as locked. This was partially because I didn't want them to run into the part that I'm talking about while they're fighting the Aranese, but I'm thankful for another reason we'll talk about in a second. But between a rope of climbing that could span the gap and several characters who could cast fly on themselves, this seemed both on flavor and reasonable. After the party has tripped a bunch of traps, we definitely got to the point where every door was scary and everyone's poking doors to make sure that nothing bad's gonna jump out at them, but the real scary trap is in room J5. See those two little black dots there? Those are sarcophagi. The sarcophagi on the right is not what it seems. It is a mimic. The leftmost houses a mummy. 
Mimics, of course, have a very egregious disguise check and they're not magical. And since Detect Undead is a cone, you can't point that cone where the mummy is without walking into the Mimic's threat range. And that's where the shenanigans began. You're so used to looking for traps in a similar place over and over again, because we've seen the same kinds of traps over and over, you forget. At least in the case of my players, honestly, I think this was intentional. I think that's the genius of whoever wrote this dungeon. You start looking in the same place over and over for the same kind of stuff, and then walk into a mimic who holds someone in place while mummies show up, and of course, mummies paralyze you. That trap was so rough that it cost our bard and our sorcerer their lives. Now, I consider myself to be a very fair GM. Twice in my career, I have flubbed dice rolls in such a way that a PC would live. In one occasion, someone I hadn't seen in a while had rolled up a character for the only game I've played front to back, and basically how I learned how to Pathfinder that game was, showed up with a Draconic Blood Rager. That Draconic Blood Rager got crit in the dome by, I believe it was a hill giant, I forget, for exactly their full hit points but I rolled down the damage. In the second scenario, Gripply Magus fights what's known as a Hekoshu, gargantuan crocodile from Assyrian, gets nommed and swallowed whole. I decided it would be appropriate for the crocodile to instead spit the Gripply out because the Gripply was poisonous. That one I got kind of in trouble for because the player in question and I didn't have the best relationship, though we thought we did. Long conversations on car rides, and we don't need to talk about that, but in both cases, I truly regret it. And that's where we get to the crux of what we're talking about today. I don't think in fantasy role-playing games, death necessarily has to be the end of a character's career. I've been playing TTRPGs, admittedly, probably not as long as some of the people who are listening to this. I started casually in 2000 and I, I believe 13, picked it up seriously in 14 and then even more seriously when we started BDG. And I've rolled a lot of dice and I've killed a lot of things, but I'm telling y'all now, despite the fact that I love character optimization, I'll always do it. It's fun to play with the numbers. The things I remember most are the stories that come from the games that were told up to and including in published adventures. I don't exactly remember the fight with Zanesha or Bakmorian in Rise of the Rune Lords, at least not one for one, and I only remember the Grawls because Pathfinder's ogres are bleh. But what I do remember is bonding with members of my team over it. Anybody remember Black Maga from Rise of the Rune Lords? The party's witch comes running up to me and says, Necross, name some place we've been to when we have to try to teleport away and everyone else has gone to Magnamar and I just say the first thing that popped in my head, oh, sound point. Oops, we're now very far away from the rest of the party. And now me and that player and that character have a bonding time together. Near death experiences do that. So too do death experiences. It's literally in the text for like all of the spells that bring you back to life. This is an ordeal. Your character, should you choose to buy the diamond or maybe you have a high enough level divine caster in squad who can just resurrect you, will have gone through something to do this. Webster defines ordeal in the case we're looking at as a severe trial or experience. Now, if your group doesn't want to role play, then that's one thing, but honestly, I think you're selling yourself short there. However that pans out, in order to get that character back, that character has gone through a severe trial or experience. And that's literally what's happening to Jonathal in Carrying Crown, assuming we don't TPK, frankly. When Jonathal comes back, I believe there's even talk of re-rolling the class into something else because, well, now he's seen some stuff. Is it... 100% where that player saw his character going? Probably not, but it is a story that you will remember for years and years to come, and further, death of important NPCs, characters, so on and so forth, can 100% be used to enhance the narrative. There are about a billion and a half examples of this in pop culture. Boromir's death in Fellowship of the Ring had some far-reaching consequences in Return of the King, I won't spoil this one too hard, but I'm a real big fan of Red Dead Redemption 2, and there are a lot of important deaths in that plot, all of which further the story. The story would not have gone anywhere near the same place if 
the people who wrote the story had decided to pull those punches. Oh, also Game of Thrones. Not only is this an ordeal for like the person who is being brought back, should they not be resurrected or should they be resurrected changed or however it is you want to flavor this out. Also, it's most likely an ordeal for the party at large. Sure, it's really common. We see it all the time. Tabletop role-playing games are blatantly games of violence. Murder hoboing aside, that's probably about what three-fourths of the rules of like D&D and Pathfinder and stuff are for, when you want to cause severe harm to someone else. And a lot of times I think the players and the GMs and all of us don't super think about the consequences mentally on the people who are doing these things, especially when one of their friends, someone they've shared drinks with, someone they've often spent the night at the same campsite with, bonded with, grown with, has an unfortunate event happen in combat and they die, which again, furthers the plot, makes the story deeper, makes the story more fulfilling. Therefore, I don't think death is defeat. And I'm sure there's a lot of GMs and a lot of players who are like, well, how do I get my character back? What if we have no gold and no cleric? Well, wealth by level is a thing for a reason. A, B, session zero is a thing. GM, if you'd like your game to be uber deadly and death to be permanent, talk to people, but make sure they sign off on it. And C, something I didn't realize I'd stolen from an old friend of mine who used to be my game master, a simple question you can ask your players should the unfortunate happen. To have a very pointed example, and so I'm not throwing names around that make no sense. In this particular scenario, after we were done playing, I said, Ross, is this the end of Jonathal? And we talked about it, and at the end, no. The goal there now is my player has expressed that they would like to continue playing that character, which is totally fair, doubly, triply so, if you've invested money, anything from special dice to a painted Hero Forge mini and everything in between into that character, and they just have bad luck sometimes, it is now on me to find a way in the story to introduce a way to get that character back. Does that derail the plot? A little, especially in a published adventure like Carrion Crown. But one of the golden rules of gaming that I've learned when I started BDG is that it's not my game, it's our game. And if it would make a better story to make a deal with someone for Jonathal's soul or have to do some kind of extra something for the money for the diamond or go into debt with a church of Abadar, so on and so forth, then so be it. Not only have I, again, made the game our game, especially a pre-published adventure, it is now our adventure, I'm allowing my player to play the character that they wanted to play. And further, that character's plot arc has now gone 90 degrees to the right from where we saw it. In any case, what do y'all think? How have you resolved deaths in your games? Do you allow your players to flavor their own deaths in the same way that they flavor their own kills? If you gotta go, you might as well go out with style, right? Throw it down in the comments. Let me know what you're thinking. Videos like this will probably be a little more what we see on BBG for a while. I want to try a new format, share my thoughts, share my opinions. If you like it, let me know. If you hate it, let me know and we'll go back. But until then, thank y'all for watching. We'll see you next time.